All right, Ian Thompson, former Sports Illustrated, NBA.com writer, who wrote the book, The Soul of Basketball. We just thought we'd have a good old NBA chat. We're approaching that point of the season, aren't we, Ian, where it goes into the All-Star break. And, and you know, the word is always that it the comp starts after the All-Star break. That's exactly right. Uh, and the trade deadline's coming up. Um, there's a lot of parity in the NBA. It's really hard to predict who's going to win. Usually this is... A, quite a predictable league, right? I mean, usually only there are only a few teams with a chance, but we have no idea who's going to win the, the West or the East, and health is going to have a lot to do with it. Teams are going to be looking for depth. There's going to be a lot of trades coming up. The Lakers are going to be at the center of all the conversation, with this, as well as LeBron James has been playing lately for a team that hasn't been in contention. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. Okay, let's just let's just start with the Lakers and start with LeBron, of course, because he's chasing down Kareem, and it's going to happen soon. Why are they going to be the big topic of conversation? I was watching them the other day, uh, and they beat Memphis. They came back; it was a fantastic win, and you can't. And that was with Anthony Davis on the sideline. And you're sitting there thinking, "Wow, is this team up for it?" And then, of course, they get whipped by the Clippers yesterday. Yeah, they're they are a flawed team, and it just doesn't make sense to me. I thought when they made the trade for Anthony Davis years ago that they were going to win three or four championships together, that they would blow by the Boston Celtics for the most championships by an NBA team in, in the history of the league. And LeBron was going to really challenge, if not overtake, Michael Jordan and, and the talk over who's the greatest player of all time. And it just hasn't happened. And a big part of it is Anthony Davis has not been able to stay healthy and uh, his shooting has really receded. And then they have not done a good job of building a team around LeBron James. I mean, everyone in the NBA knows that you, when you have someone like him, you surround them with shooters, and they have not done that. They lack shooting. They lack size with Anthony Davis out. They made a nice little trade recently for Rui Hachimura from, um, from the Washington Wizards. Uh, but this is not a high-energy player that they trade for. He's not going to help them out on defense. It's not known for his rebounding. So it, it doesn't make any sense that they're wasting these golden years that LeBron James has given them. He's playing at a better level at his age than anybody really has played any sport that anybody knows of, including Tom Brady, the football star here. It's, LeBron's just blowing everyone else away at his age. When you, when you look at this, the all-time scoring list, the top 10, Kareem uh, is there on 38-387 at the moment, and LeBron is just tucked in behind, 38-210. People hit last night, he hit 46 in, uh, even in, a, in a defeat to the Clippers. The field goal percentage, though, is that the stat that you want to be looking at? Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, 58.2. Kareem, 55.9. LeBron, 50.5. Um, so anything over 50%. Is that, I mean, just describe to us or explain to us why that is a sign of real greatness. It is, and... You know, with the advanced analytics, people have kind of gotten away from it a little bit, but it is it is uh, an easy thing, an easy way to gauge these players. And the big guys always have a better shooting percentage because they just naturally play closer to the basket. For LeBron to be shooting 50% shows how deadly a finisher he's been throughout his career uh, because he takes a lot of perimeter shots, long shots, much longer shots than Shaq or Kareem or any of those other bigger guys have, have done. Um, and then he's, he's come to rely on the three-pointer right, quite a lot. And if you're shooting 40%, excuse me there, I'm at an airport. And it's like, excuse right. me. Yep. But as, as, you, as you take the three-point shot into account, if you're shooting 40% from the three-point line, that's tremendous. I don't think he's ever been that good. You know, LeBron, um, when he went to Miami, he made it a point of emphasis to become a good jump shooter. And that's something he was not before he went to Miami. And uh, for a time when we was with Miami Heat, he was possibly the best um, two-point jump shooter in the NBA, uh, taking jump shots, but within the two-point line. That became a real go-to shot for him. Um, it's just amazing to me that a guy with his athleticism and still leaping for dunks and playing both ends of the court as he does, is able to be on the verge of setting the record of longevity because his game still is built on athleticism. And you would have thought he would have had to change his style, but he hasn't. Um, and so if you want to, we can talk a little bit about what this means as far as the, the race between uh, LeBron and Jordan. Because yes, I do. Yeah, really Ian, yeah. look, I wanted now. to, yeah, that, that was going to be my next question. I was just writing down in front of you here. Ian Thompson is with us, a soul of basketball that he wrote. And we're just having a good old NBA chat here on the platform. 
you know, and I was, uh, you know, I was arguing with that, uh, well, arguing, just discussing with the kids when we were over in our holiday in America, actually, just before Christmas, and about who is the goat. And uh, my older brother brought up an argument and said, "Look, it's about longevity, sure, and over, you know, the period of of his career, the standard he has set, the excellence and things." But his question was, and I'm fascinated to know your answer, mate. Uh, he said, was LeBron that guy when he first got into the league, or did it take him four or five years to become that guy? Whereas he said Michael Jordan, when Michael Jordan got into the league, was pretty much one of the best players within a year or so. What are your thoughts? Oh, well, by, by LeBron's second year, he was one of the best players, and uh, he was very young when he led an undermanned Cleveland team into the NBA Finals. They got smoked there by San Antonio. They just... but but. There, there was a stretch very early in his career when LeBron was scoring 25 straight points in a crucial playoff game against the Detroit Pistons. I mean, 25 points, all, all 25 points of his team were scored by LeBron in a row. It's, it was unheard of. And that, those are the kinds of things he was doing without the skills that he would generate later, that he'd create later, the, the jump shooting skills, the post-up skills. Michael Jordan was like that too. Michael Jordan became a much better shooter as he aged. Uh, he always had a post-up game, but he became a much better shooter as he aged. I, I look at it uh, a little bit um, like like your brother was it, um, that um, the, each is the best in his own category. In terms of longevity, LeBron is, is better than anybody ever. Um, Kareem was that guy, but LeBron has eclipsed Kareem in terms of being excellent for an incredibly long period of time. But if you were to take the two and match them up in their primes against each other, Michael Jordan against LeBron, I think most people that saw Michael Jordan would say Michael Jordan would win those battles and his team would win those battles. There's just a a ruthlessness, a killer instinct, um, a finishing quality that Michael had that no one else uh, has had. Um, If he knew, uh, if he knew that, that LeBron was his challenger and that they were competing to decide who was the best ever. There's no way Michael Jordan would allow himself to lose those battles. So in terms of longevity, LeBron, without a doubt, uh, in terms of the bursts of creativity and, and basketball excellence at his best, he's second to Michael Jordan. And that's no criticism. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Ian Thompson is with us. Why is it important or is it unimportant or is it just fun or is it silly or is it pointless to have these kind of conversations about who is the best player? I mean, this is what we do, us sports fans, don't we? We love it. We love discussing all kind of things. Is it that important or not? I think it's very important. If we didn't have these conversations, uh, it would mean we weren't invested in it. Okay. We didn't care that much. And yeah, yeah, it's and, and you know, sometimes players complain about these conversations, but I've heard the players talk about it among themselves too. They, they have the same conversations we're having. And you're going to read, um, when LeBron breaks this record of Kareem's, you're going to see modern day players saying LeBron's the best ever. Have okay, they so all right, all did right. They, did they go back and watch the Michael Jordan stuff um, the, way, the way the rest of us have? Maybe, maybe not. And you know, there, there's a really good case to be made that LeBron is the greatest of all time. It's just my opinion. I haven't seen both guys that, that he's, he's a close second to, to Jordan. Ian Thompson is with us, former Sports Illustrated writer, NBA.com, the soul of basketball. He's having a good old NBA rap. All right, Eastern Conference, Western Conference. I've got the tables in front of me here. Who are the best teams? Uh, I know that, you know, and that doesn't mean who's sitting at the top of the table at the moment, but in your mind, if they can get, you know, fit, healthy, uh, the stretch, who, who's, who's, who's got what it takes to actually clutch to close out? Let's start with the Eastern Conference. Who are your two or three best teams that you think, yes, these two will be in the Eastern Conference final. One of them will definitely go through to the finals. I, I do think it will come down to Boston and Milwaukee, um, which is really what it came down to last year. Um, those were the two best teams, and Milwaukee was right there with Boston without Chris Middleton. Again, this season, they've been without Chris Middleton for most of the year, their second-best player. He's just now come back. We'll see how long he can stay with them. Um, if, if he is healthy, if, if he can use these next several months to get healthy and fully ingrained in their offense, and, and they are a whole team, they have their whole roster together, um, then I think uh, it's going to be quite a battle because the Celtics 
are going to be going into the playoffs with a rookie head coach. So usually you would think a team like the Celtics that's growing, the growth would be included in their coaching staff and, and the coach of last year and the experience of when he was probably out coached by Steve Kerr in the finals would help him, but they don't have that advantage. I think Joe Mazzulla, the, the rookie, the interim head coach for the Celtics this year is going to be, you have to say he's going to be operating at a deficit when he goes up against the box coach, Mike Budenholzer, who has a lot of experience with an NBA championship. Or if he gets into a finals against maybe Steve Kerr, who is one of the greatest coaches of all time, that's going to be the issue. The Celtics are not playing the defense that they played last year. They're still top five or six in the league defensively, but over the second half of last year, they were the dominant team defensively. And as well as they've played this year, they haven't shown that on the defensive end. So I like Boston to get to the finals, but I wouldn't be surprised if Milwaukee edges them out for it. And then Philly, Philadelphia is right there too. They played very well over the last couple of months and they're going to have a chance at it as well. You, you didn't mention the Nets in there and they went on a real tear. They won, what, 12 or 13 or 14 in a row before uh, KD got uh, injured. So what about their prospects? I guess they should be included. Um, and... This is the year to bet on the Nets if you're ever going to do it because both of their stars are coming off a, a postseason last year when they were humiliated. And uh, they went to the offseason. Kevin Durant demanded a trade, but no one was willing to trade the pieces necessary to get him. Kyrie Irving thought he could force his way out of Brooklyn, but found out that no one wanted to sign him. Uh, and so they both have had their comeuppance. And I think this is the year where you see them both being really uh, focused. So I am i wouldn't count on them, but they're another team. They, they entirely have, have it in them to get to the finals and maybe even win the championship. It's just that they're, they've just been so unreliable the last couple of years. And you feel kind of silly talking about them in those terms. Ian Thompson is with us. We're talking NBA. Look, let's look at the Western Conference. Nuggets and Grizzlies at the top, and they've got a big handy lead, those two teams. And then I come down uh, to the Suns in seventh spot, who are just having a very average season, but you expect them if they get healthy. Uh, the Warriors, of course, uh, they're below the 500 at the moment, but again, the same argument. Then you come all the way down to 13th here, Ian, and the Lakers are 22-26. But the way that you've been talking, you know, you're very confident that they that they will get it together as well, it's it just it's, you know I, I just find it just intriguing that you know the two teams at the top with the best records going into the All Star break are clearly the two best teams, no question about that because the table doesn't lie. Yet all of us are probably uh, you know forgive me if I'm overstepping here, but all of us are probably still thinking about the other teams that I've mentioned: the Suns, the Lakers, the Warriors. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I would not myself include the Suns in that category. They just they they aren't showing any sign uh, of recreating the energy that they've had the last couple of years. Um, when they lost by 50 or whatever it was in their concluding game in the playoffs last year on their home court, I believe uh, they they have never recovered from that, and I, I I'll be surprised if they do. Maybe they'll make a big trade in the next couple of weeks to try to change their chemistry and get things going again. But I, 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 I think their best years are behind them. Um, the two best teams by far this year in the West are Denver and Memphis. And I think Memphis is especially dangerous because they're playing the best defense lately of anybody in the NBA. If they're healthy, they're going to be really tough. Um, uh, Denver's got the best player. Jokic has been the best player and deserves to win the third straight MVP award. And by the end of the year, Jamal Murray will be recovered from his knee surgery. And I think they're going to be really hard to beat. And then uh, I, I would put the Warriors as a very dangerous dark horse because they still believe they can be there. I would look for them to make a trade in the next couple of weeks to try to deepen their bench because they have no size and they have very little depth. And they probably have to trade a couple of their young prospects to try to get some players in there to win now because they have a chance to win right now. With every year that goes by and Steph Curry, Draymond Green, Clay Thompson get older, those chances recede. They need to take advantage while they can. And I would think they'll make a trade to, to try to improve their chances. If they can get into the playoffs as a number six seed or something, they're going to be very confident they can beat anybody, but only if they address those problems with their roster. Ian, final question, and I thank you so much for your time. I'm just sitting here. Just, I know that people are just going to absolutely be loving this. I've already had a couple of texts through from friends who are saying, wow, is that the guy that wrote this whole of basketball? I said, yeah, yeah, that's him. 
How fortunate we are to have you on the program. Obviously, I want the Kiwi connection to finish with Stephen Adams. He's injured at the moment. He's done. He's got a, a, something wrong with his knee and a big man like that. That's always a very worrying injury. You know, he's having a career year. Offensive rebounds, just a monster. Um, you know, how do you, how do you define him? How good is he? Does what, what would he need to do to his game to, to really elevate it? And how important is he? A lot of questions here, but I know that you'll be able to answer them to that Grizzly side. Well, he is the strongest physically pers- person in the NBA. He's the strongest just player. Um, and he's still continuing to be relevant, even though the center position has really changed a lot, as, as you well know, over the last few years. It's not – if he were playing the NBA 20 years ago, the way he plays now, he'd be, he'd be a dominant player. He, they, they would – they'd be – looking for him to score a lot more than they do now around the basket, obviously. And, you know, he'd be matched up against some of the dominant players in the NBA, um, but, but it's not a center driven league anymore. So for him to, uh, to improve his rating, you know, to, to gain more respect from people, he's got to be contributing to a winning team. And he has a chance to do that. I mean, they're looking pretty good. Um, and if healthy, they have a chance to go for it. So I, I like his chances of doing that and, and being a relevant player on a really good team. Look, one of, one of the things that does frustrate me, though, is he doesn't he doesn't shoot. And I, I've got this, I mean, you might, you know, you obviously disagree with me, but I've got this theory that, look, if you're playing football, round ball, I don't care what position you are, even if you're the goalkeeper, you've got to be able to put your foot through the ball towards the opposition's goal. If necessary, maybe it might be needed. I look at Stephen Adams and I think, why don't you just practice, practice, practice? Get yourself a nice two-point shot or a three-point shot because it could be that final play in a game. And if you're standing there, no one thinks that you can do it. They'll all double-team jar. It might just be the difference. I mean, is that a, is that a, is that a silly way of arguing this? No, no. There's lots of big men. Uh, Jonas Valanciunas is one I can think of. Uh, that uh, uh, there's lots of big men. Uh, Brooke Lopez. That have extended their range, like you're talking about, and have um, have sort of modernized their game, mm. and they can do a lot more than they used to. Uh, Stephen Adams is playing the old school center position. You know, on the one hand, in the NBA, people say you you only have to do one or two things really well to be a really good player in the NBA, and he does those well. I mean, he rebounds, defends, sets screens. Uh, he's a great complementary player. You're not going to ask him to shoot jump shots. You know, uh, he's probably tried to do it, and it just hasn't worked out. Um, if he had the skills, you know, his coaches would ask him to do it. I don't know if he's been practicing or not. I don't know if his, he was practicing. His coaches said, what the hell are you doing? Get back into the paint. You know, we, we don't know what was yeah, going on yeah. with him. But uh, for, for what he's doing, for who he is, and for him to be a relevant player in the NBA, despite the fact that, that players like him are tend to be going extinct in the NBA now, uh, I think it speaks a lot. It speaks very highly of him that he still has an important role in the league. Thank you so, so much for all the time you've given us. Absolutely brilliant, Ian. Appreciate it enormously. Uh, no, I appreciate it, Martin. Nice speaking with you. Thank you.